Hey guys, we're here for another great podcast on Life Optimized. I'm Dr. Neil Paulman, and we have a great interview today with Dr. Dan Goodnow. Uh, he is a scientist and associated with Proton. We're going to talk about his bio here. Dr. Goodnow is a research into biochemical mechanism of disease started in 1990. His curiosity about the biochemistry of life is as insatiable today as it was 30 years ago. In those 30 years, Dr. Goodnow invented and developed advanced bioinformatic technologies designed and manufactured novel supplements and identified biochemical prodromes of numerous diseases, including Alzheimer's disease and dementia, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, autism, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, and numerous cancers. So Dr. Goodnow, thanks for coming on with us. So before we start doing a deep dive, introduce, uh, introduce yourself. Tell us, I know we're gonna to talk today about mostly plasmologists, but also kind of go on some um, interesting uh, tangents. So again, thanks for coming on and uh, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Neil. And thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to your, your group. Um, yeah, so my background is in psychiatric medicine. So my PhD is actually in psychiatry, looking at the biochemical mechanisms of psychiatric disease. And my background is also as a synthetic organic chemist. And over the years, when we're looking at biochemical mechanisms of disease, I've invented certain technologies that have allowed me to look at thousands and thousands of small molecules or metabolites, if you will, in biological systems and published and patented fairly extensively on causal mechanisms of disease. And the real ability came from this, this core technology platform called non-targeted metabolomics. And so we've got our facility here in Temecula called the Dr. Goodnow Research Institute. We have a lot of high-end mass spectrometry, like ion cyclotrons, um, and magnetic sector, inductively coupled plasma mass specs, and, and so on. So pretty well, we can measure anything on earth here. And so we do a lot of research around the world, a lot of projects with uh, Rush University in Chicago, several thousands of blood samples. And some of that research is, is published for, via peer review journals. Like we just published work on postmortem brain analysis of plasmalogens, showing that the level of, and we'll get into plasmalogens here in a minute, the level of plasmalogens in your brain correlate with your cognitive functioning more strongly than any other biomarker in your brain. And then obviously we've looked at this in your blood and understanding the role of plasmalogens in uh, deterioration not just of the brain, but also of your muscles and other aspects of it. And this is where this came out of this kind of large epidemiological research is that this level of plasmalogens, these critical membrane lipids of your body, um, decrease later on in life. And their decrease is associated with several neurological issues, as well as other basic core physiological functions of heart function, lung function, even cancer-related issues. So we're dealing... The plasmalogen story is a, is a very core human physiological story. And it actually starts just before birth. The plasmalogen story starts in humans at gestational week 30. And so it's a big story. So I'll kind of get into those details. That's my background. I look at the mechanisms, try to find solutions. If there are solutions out there like N-acetylcysteines and carnitines and your B vitamins. And, and so they're easily accessible, but quite often they're not understood or used as a true biochemical engineering. So what we really do here is human bioengineering. We take human biochemical intermediates and we optimize health and function um, by strategically supplementing those areas that need it. And through that process, we can maintain function indefinitely is our, is our goal here. And so that's kind of what we do as an organization um, from an from a optimization perspective. And plasmalogens are a core part of that story, but there's a, a bunch of other um, biochemical intermediates that you can use to, to optimize your health. And, um, and that's why advanced blood testing followed with um, strategic um, uh, supplement intervention is uh, what we do. And then plasmalogens are, like I said, we'll talk about it here, but it's a big, big hammer um, in terms of neurological health. So that's kind of the story. And um, I think we'll just probably chronologically dig dig into this thing as you as you see fit. Does that make sense? 
Like, no, exactly. No, I, I, that's what we're going to do. So you, yeah, you mentioned a couple of key things. So just first explaining it, um, it's coming more and more common what metabolomics are. Like you said, it, we're, what's great about where we're going with science now is that we're not kind of guessing and just throwing things against the wall and saying what sticks. We're now being much more specific and A, doing more testing and then treating based on the test. And then B, we have much more specific hammers like you talked about, like plasmologens that can can fix what we find. So right. yeah, and, and this, that first and then we'll do it. Yeah, and this is actually a really good, I'll try to just, you know, break down some, some myths and some things that appear so obvious, which in fact turn out not to be true at all. And there's really three levels of human physiology. One is a genetic level, which all everyone talks about. I have a gene for this or a gene for that. And then, but those genes don't really do anything. Your genetic code is a library. It's a list of possible reactions, possible adaptations you have to a given change in your environment. So your, your genetic code gives you your total possible responses to an event, but they don't actually do anything. So then when, the, when your genetic code responds to an event, whether it's exercise or whether it's an insult or whether it's a gunshot wound to your shoulder, okay, you're going to have, it's, your body is designed to be adaptive to its environment. And it has a lack of knowledge as to what that environmental change will be. And then it says, holy crap, something's going on. What can I do to, to mediate this situation? And then your genetic code sends out these possible responses to an event. And it sends those responses out through what's called messenger RNA, um, which is your, your transcriptomics. Like, so when people talk about gene, gene chip type data, and then that transcript data gets translated into proteins. These are the physical molecules that, that your body uses to work. And then the proteome, which is these proteomics where people talk about proteins, like your, your transport proteins in your blood or receptors. If you talk about, hey, I have a receptor drug, it impacts this receptor, that receptor, that's your proteome. Metabolomics are all the small molecules that interact. So virtually every single drug in your pharmacy, okay, is a metabolite. It's a metabolomic. And all, virtually all of drug chemistry is designed only one or two steps removed from the natural world of either um, herbal supplements or actual food intermediates. Okay, so so the molecules, so we live, we ingest metabolites. Okay, we don't, if we ingest a protein, for example, if I eat a steak and there's protein in it, okay, those proteins, I don't use those proteins as a general rule, unless you're taking some certain peptides and there's, there's a very, very small portion of what we ingest that is used in that form. We take all this complex molecules in our environment and we convert them down to metabolites, small molecules, peptides, small peptides, amino acids, fats, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, all that stuff. That core small molecule component are called metabolites. That's actually what the human body lives on and it gets absorbed. And then you rebuild those proteins and genes and things from that. So the human body is fundamentally a bioreactor. Okay, we are, we, we take, biochemical intermediates, you're like a brewery, okay? And depending upon what you feed People it, don't like that answer. Okay, <laughs> okay. exactly, right? And so, and so what happens then is that you have your genetic code and your proteins, that's kind of the hardware of your, hardware and software of your system, but the actual operation, okay? Like you have a word processor, but a word processor just writes the words, okay? The word processor does not write the novel. It does not tell you, you know, a tale of two cities or it doesn't, it doesn't actually write the book. Okay. That's written by you. It is just physical hardware that you, that your body uses to, to do that. So that's where metabolomics come in and metabolomics measure real time. So when you talk about genetics, genetics are just a predisposition. It's basically saying when you change your environment to a certain degree that gets out of your genetic window. Okay, then you create a disease. So because you get out of sight of your tolerance window and that's when you reach a circumstance that is beyond your, your personal genetics ability to adapt. And that's where a genetic predisposition to a disease occurs from. So genes do not create diseases. Genes expose 
risk to a disease, but they do not create a disease. Genes are silent until an environmental circumstance arises that is beyond your personal genetic code. So it looks like a gene causes things. So if I take a thousand people and I, and I, I expose all these people to the same level of stress, okay, I'm gonna get some people that have no problem. Okay, they're, they're, they're completely able to tolerate that particular stressor. And you're gonna get some people who can't and they will suffer and they will have cascading negative effects from it. And you can say, oh, that person has a gene that causes that disease. Well, no, actually what they had is a predisposition to a disease that, that they experienced an environmental situation that was beyond their ability to adapt. So by maintaining your environment within your personal genetic window silences genes. And we just published this with regards to one of the most important genes in, on, on earth is the ApoE4 genotype risk for Alzheimer's. So apolipoprotein is one of E, you have different lipoproteins that transport molecules through your blood because your blood is aqueous and we have to transport fat all around the body. Just like you can't pour oil down your sink and think it's going to float in water, it's going to stick everywhere. And so what your body does is it takes all that fat, puts it on these big, highly water-soluble proteins, and that uses it for transport things. ApoE4 is one of those transport proteins. And the it's a risk for Alzheimer's disease. People that have an E4 genotype have a higher risk for Alzheimer's. But if you have high levels of plasmalogens, the E4 does not increase your risk for Alzheimer's. So it's it only occurs later on in life when something else becomes missing. And so this is a part with the whole concept of biochemical engineering is that virtually every genetic predisposition to a disease, even some serious ones, you can silence those genetic predispositions through metabolics. Um, just, and, and it's not, and it's, this is not fantasy. This is how we treat inborn errors of metabolism in children. Okay, a child gets born with a, with a mutation that can't process something. And so what do you do? You change the diet and environment. And all of a sudden the child does a completely normal life because you've, you've removed that environmental window that they can't tolerate. So you got a child with PKU and you, you eliminate phenyl, um, phenylalanine in their diet. And all of a sudden they have a completely normal life. And all you're doing in that situation is ensuring that the living environment of that human being stays within the window that their genetic code is totally happy and tolerating from. And so when we talk about type 2 diabetes and we talk about coronary artery disease or COPD or asthma or these diseases that we get later on in life for the most part, um, these are situations when whatever happens in your personal circumstances have put you in a window that you can't that's outside your tolerance window. So that's the whole concept of genes, metabolites, and proteins. You have control of your metabolome, okay? And your metabolome influences your genetic code. So as you change, like your body is, your genes are designed to keep you alive. Saying it isn't, they don't know if you're gonna have a pint of ice cream or pineapples or a salad for lunch. And so it has to adapt to what you do to it. And so people think these genes are protagonistic, that they actually are causing something. Your genetic code is entirely reactionary and it will change and you, you control how your genes are being expressed. Your expression of your genes do not control you. And that's how people talk about these, these uh, um, gene methylation and epigenetics and all that kind of stuff. That, that whole epigenetics field is designed to keep you from blowing a gasket as your body slows down as you get older. So anyways, so that's a big philosophical process of metabolites. And that's why certain blood tests and certain supplements have extreme levels of power in terms of optimizing our, our, our physiological health. Huge. There's a lot to unpack there and a lot of great information. So just so our, the listeners out there can understand what we're saying and not either panicking or be really excited. A, three main points I want to bring out about that. A, like Dr. Bruno said, the genes are there. It's a, a broad roadmap. It's not specific. Not specific. It doesn't mean everything that's in your genetic code is something you're automatically destined for. You can change it environmentally through things that you take in, how, anything from how much sleep you take in to, as he mentioned, certain amino acids like phenylalanine in certain places you can't use it. So you can alter your genetic code. Your genetic code does not alter your destiny specifically. 
Two, you mentioned um, APOE4, which has gotten become more and more popular as people, more and more people are doing genetic testing, as more and more people are trying to prevent disease. The medical paradigm is trying to flip a little bit. Once they were just treating disease, we're trying to prevent it before it happens. They're finding out that they have APOE4, which unfortunately, like you said, does have a risk for Alzheimer's. But again, there are things that you can do to limit the risk of developing Alzheimer's. Um, and then the third piece, as you mentioned, and that's what we're going to kind of get into now, is that there's certain uh, supplements or, or metabolites that you can use that have, are much more powerful, much bigger sledgehammers than others are. And one of those are plasmologens, which is, I know, is one of your biggest endeavors. And um, from friends and patients of mine who have started taking plasmologens have noticed a dramatic effect. I get that question all the time. How do I know when something's working? And this is one of the products that when people take plasmologens, they feel it. They feel in their cognition. They may have more energy. They notice it in a lot of different ways. So you kind of highlight a little bit what are plasmologens, and you mentioned that they, as we get aid, they do decrease like other, other a lot of other things. So what do we need to know? Let about me begin that. So yeah. So nice little tangent at the beginning, but that's exactly correct, Neil. Um, your summary was perfect. The plasmologens are a type of membrane lipid. Now, the next part about human physiology that we, we so often gloss over core components because they kind of get boring. Hey, we've been studying this since the 30s and 40s. There's nothing more to figure out that, like basic mitochondrial function or basic membrane structure. The human body is fundamentally compartmentalized by membranes. Okay, just like your walls in your house separate your kitchen from your bathroom from your bedroom and allows you to do certain functions in one area without affecting things in the other area. And we do that in our house with, with bricks and plaster and so on. In your body, you do that with, with lipids, fat, membrane lipids called phospholipids. This is what your body uses to create what's called biological walls or membranes. And it's what separates your heart from your brain, okay, very large distances. It's also what separates inside your cells and the different compartments inside your cell, like your mitochondria from the peroxisome and other areas of, of functionality. And so these membrane lipids are one of the core components of human physiology. And it affects everything, like your cardiac rhythms for if you're if you have arrhythmias, okay, if you have uh, breathing problems, that's a membrane related transfer of oxygen through your membranes of your lungs. Okay, kidney failure, that's membrane lipid transport between and clearance of, of toxins. So, and then we, the big thing with the plasmalogens is that, and so most of these phospholipids are ubiquitous, right? We don't, we, we take them for granted because we get them in our diet. You get them in your eggs, you get them in your meat products. Okay, your body can make them. Okay, and that's true for most of your phospholipids. It's, unfortunately, it's not true for this core group called plasmalogens. And so plasmalogens are one of those critical membrane lipids. What makes them unique from the other fossil lipids, like when you get, like say a krill oil, or you get some sort of other supplement of, of um, like when you're eating salmon, okay, a nice fatty fish, for example, those will have primarily typical fossil lipids. The plasmalogens, you physically make them and you make a lot of them. Um, and you start making them just before you're born. And then you make them for the, your entire life. But 30% of your brain, very high levels of your ethanolamine content of your membrane synapses are like 75% of these plasmalogens, not, not a trivial amount. So let me tell you a little bit why these things are so critical and why people, when they start taking plasmalogens, really start noticing differences. And they really notice improvements of sleep, calmness in terms of those people with anxiety or autoimmune stress issues. But in the performance space, your neuromuscular junctions, your cognitive functioning dramatically improves. And the reason isn't, is, it's not magic. It's actually quite straightforward. I mean, it, it deals with basic human neurology. And plasmalogens have this, have two primary roles in neurology. One is it's important for the protective coding around your axons. So electrical, you, you, you can think of your neurology of the human body. It's not like a computer. It's more like the wiring harness of your car or the wiring in your house. And all this 
wiring has two components and your brain and your, your, in your physiological neurology has the same thing. All nerve transmission has two components. One is how do I get a signal from point A all the way to point B? Okay, how do I send electricity from my light switch to my light bulb? Okay, and I do that with a wire. It's a long wire and the transmission just goes through that wire and that wire is protected with, a, with, a, with an insulated coating so that it's not short circuiting inside your walls. Okay, that's, that's the transmission it's called nerve conductivity. Okay, and we talk about that peripheral nerve conductivity and you want that nerve signal to be strong and fast. And the way your body makes it strong and fast is by having a very powerful protective coating. So diseases like ALS or multiple sclerosis, those are diseases where mice get into the walls and start chewing the electrical coating off the wires and the wires, and all of a sudden that signal doesn't get from the light switch to the light bulb. Okay, that's a white matter disease. And plasmalogens make up almost 80%. So those that protective coating on your, your axons, not just in your brain, but all the, your neuromuscular, your heart, Everywhere in your body that has a neuron, okay, which is basically everywhere, that has a protective coating. In your periphery, they call it a Schwann cell. In your brain, it's an oligodendrocyte, but it's called a white matter. And there's a class of plasmalogens, specifically omega-9 plasmalogens, that, pr that produce this really pr protective coating. And quite frankly, that's the bulk. And you start making these at 30-week gestation, about two weeks, about, about, uh, about a month and a half before you're born. And the, when you're first born, you're born with very, very little myelin and very, very little plasmalogens. Your brain first lays out the neurons and then it comes and starts coding and protecting them. So the first three years of life is massive myelination of the brain and it protect, it, it's all this, this protective coding. And this is what gives us precision, fine, fine motor skills, all this kind of fine thought. The white matter connectivity is what allows the body to make very, very precise neurological activities. One signal, one light bulb goes on. So that's the white matter part. The second part of all neurological systems is the connection part. Okay, it's when at the end of the wire, when the, that copper wire, when they take off the, you peel off the protective coating and you see that copper wire sitting right in the center. And that's where the electricity actually leaves that wire and connects it with another wire. So you have to have a switching plate. How do I switch it? How does the electricity go from one wire to another wire? And you know, in your wall, you have a, a light switch. And your body, of course, is not made of that. Your body is made of actual biological material. Your body makes it, you know, called a, it's called a synapse in the brain and in, in your muscles, it's called the neuromuscular junction. But you have to be able to transmit a signal from one neuron to another neuron. And that physical process is called, is with a synapse. And that is where the second class of plasmalogens play a very, very critical role. And your body can't transmit signal from one neuron to another neuron without plasmalogens. And so when you take, and that's the omega-3, the DHA, you know, about fish oil type of thing, but of course it's fish, we call fish oil fish oil because it has omega-3 in it, not, um, it normally has a phosphate, normally in triglyceride form. It's like you have fish oil and you have olive oil. Okay, they're just, they're, they're still oils. But so anyway, so those are the two core components. So when we talk about plasmalogens and their effect, so your brain, so you're, you're born actually deficient in plasmalogens and you get, you get the most of your, most of your plasmalogens when you're young is through breast milk. And this is also why breastfeeding of infants has a big impact on autism rates, has big impact on early childhood development. It's also why premature birth has these very negative consequences, both for lung function, so bronchial dysplasia in neonates, these are all related to plasmalogen deficiencies at birth and the inability to um, this massive myelination phase of the first three years of life. And so your brain continues to myelinate and the myelination continues to reinforce our signaling pathways. And your brain actually doesn't fully mature until your 50s, okay? Like the human brain actually continues to get better and better and better until basically mid 50s. So I'm good. Yeah. Now. It's like my, I'm at peak now. That's I like that. That's exactly. That's what I've heard all day. I know, but the problem is now is how do you stay there? Okay. So then, then what happens? You have this big bell curve, right? We're myelinating, myelinating, and we have this kind of this ten year window where we kind of stay there. Then all of a sudden, the brain starts losing plasmalogens. Okay. At some point, you stop making as much as you use, and you actually start just bleeding out. 
okay, of these plasmalogens, and you first lose it in your white matter. Okay, that's the first part of the brain. So when the brain shrinks with age, one of the common, you know, it's very, very reproducible finding, the human brain shrinks, like a grape shrinks into a raisin. But whereas a grape loses water to become dehydrated into a raisin, the human brain loses fat, okay? And because the human brain is made of fat. And it's made of these lipids. And it's these membranes, these membranes all full of these fossil lipids. And as soon as you can't make enough plasmalogens, they all start shrinking. Imagine it's like it's like um it's, it's like making your favorite chocolate cake for Thanksgiving, for example, right? And you have a recipe. You have 10 things that go into making your chocolate cake. You have to have the sugar, you have to have the eggs, you have to have cocoa, you have to have, you know, sugar, and you need flour. But all of a sudden, you're all ready to make cake for Thanksgiving, and you have all your ingredients, but you only have half as much flour. Well, how much cake can you make? You can only make half a cake. And so no matter what you have, if you have all the other ingredients, if you're missing half, if you're missing a core component, you can only make, that's that's the limiting factor. And so plasmalogens become this limiting factor. And so when you stop making enough plasmalogens, everything shrinks to be at the level of your plasmalogen composition. Uh, composition. So that's why we see this brain shrinkage, white matter loses it, sarcopenia when we start losing muscle mass because your body needs a signal like your your body won't build muscles it won't build bone unless it has a reason to okay like if you go lay in bed for three months okay and don't move you can't get out of bed because your body says well this person doesn't walk it has no reason to walk why why would i have muscles for a person who's not using them and that's called atrophy and so your body needs to have this ability to to react and compensate. And plasmalogens provide that signaling. So when people start taking these plasmalogens later on in life, all of a sudden you start rehydrating those raisins into grapes again, okay? And all of a sudden this signaling comes back. People start, and the, 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 the quality of the neurological signals get better and better. So that's why we see such dramatic impacts on people, not just, in the core multiple sclerosis and alzheimer's and parkinson's you know in those type of diseases we're trying to rebuild what's lost the human body and brain still has huge regenerative capabilities um we just need to make sure we give it the right materials to regenerate and that's what we kind of do here so when you have a overt disease like when you get parkinson's symptoms or alzheimer's you've lost 90 percent 80 90 percent of that function so now you're stuck trying to do two things. You're trying to get the remaining 20% to perform at 50% level, and you're trying to create neurogenesis so you can start rebuilding those pathways and re-strengthening those pathways. So it's a bit harder. So that's why prevention or maintenance of function um, is so critical. And that's the other fallacy. Uh, you know, I know I'm rambling on things here, but the people think about disease and they think about preventing disease. And if you have people in your community that, that are interested in longevity, okay, this is the other thing that people really have to get beat into them. Preventing disease does not make you live long. Preventing disease just prevents you from dying young. Okay. Preventing disease prevents premature death, but does not expand human lifespan. And that's, that's hard for people to understand. Simply removing a negative does not create a positive. Okay, if I can prevent you from dying of a cardio, of a heart attack, okay, that just prevents you from dying early from a heart attack. It doesn't make you live longer. It just prevents you from dying sooner. And major and, health span, in theory, the health, term health span has become pretty in vogue now. And it, your health span, the quality of life hopefully will improve if you don't have these illnesses like Alzheimer's or cardiac disease early. But yeah, like you said, the lifespan is what is yeah. the ultimate goal it doesn't budge yet that's correct and and because what happens is we start we get we get suckered into this chasing our tail routine right we chase this disease and then we chase that disease it's like a big dam with little leaks coming out i'm going to stick my finger in this hole stop this one and i'm going to stop this one and i'm going to stop this one but in reality health is a singularity okay your health my health all your patients health health is the same we, we actually know what health is and maintaining function is a level above preventing disease because if you maintain function you don't have disease okay disease disease doesn't take 
doesn't take your function away. You lose function and the disease comes in to fill in the void. And I think when we're talking about health span and longevity and understanding, you know, functional utility or functional vitality late in life, um, that's what our focus is on. And biochemical function um, is really what, you know, you can call it disease prevention, but it's really, and I guess it's technically it's accurate, you're preventing disease, but you're basically maintaining function. And if you maintain function, um, you, you don't have disease. So let's hit a couple of yeah, so yeah. Sorry. Let's hit a couple of questions that I know everybody wants to know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get in all the comments here. So the first question, we talked about the brain. So when so first of all, we know, and I'll let you explain it, you can you can now do lab testing to assess for plasma as we do it for testosterone or your blood sugar. So and then the kind of leads to the second question is when should people do it? And, and, and again, you answered that a little bit. It's not something that should be done at 60 years old. It's something you want to do as a preventative measure to maintain brain function and neuro neurological function um, as opposed to doing when you're 60 years old. So when, how do people check their, their plasmalogen levels? And then when do you recommend that people start using plasmalogens as a supplement? Yeah, so you want to test early for not just plasmalogens because plasmalogens are critical. Okay, but we will measure other critical biomarkers. Like there's a lot of really simple stuff, like keeping your oxidative stress markers in place, so uric acid, creatinine, making sure your cholesterol is in that mid 200s type of thing. And so these are things that you want to, plasmalogens we can measure. Okay, and we have a test called Protome Scan. We measure not just plasmalogens, we measure the different types of plasmalogens, other things like phosphocholine for reverse cholesterol transport. It's about, it's about saying, we know what health is. Okay, we've been studying healthy levels of biomarkers for a century, and we use them to compare. Say, oh, you know, what's wrong with Parkinson's? Well, here's my control population of healthy people versus my Parkinson's patient. So for all of these studies, okay, when I study MS or Parkinson's or ALS or whatever, colon cancer, all these studies have a control arm of health. So we actually have, we have the most accurate information of what health is, and we have the most accurate information about how um, um, all term mortality is associated with certain biomarkers. So those are, you want to make sure all of those are lined up properly. Plasmalogens, you want to get start early, probably in your forties and fifties. If you're, if you're, especially if you're uh, a woman of childbearing age, okay, you're the feet, the baby growing inside of you is entirely dependent upon the mother and the placenta for those plasmalogen levels when they're young and human breast milk. Human breast milk has one of the highest concentrations of plasmalogens in the entire animal kingdom, okay? And when you, the colostrum has extremely high levels and then it decreases over the first month or so. So you can imagine all the people that have these problems when they're pregnant with brain fog and energy. Well, that's because, you know, you're, you're, the young woman is making enough plasmalogens for herself and for her baby at the same time. So any woman who's getting pregnant should be dealing with plasmalogens. There's also studies with sperm motility and stuff like that. So improving um, fertility in males is also related to plasmalogen content as well. So I think in our younger ages, that's important. Advanced athletes, people that are pushing themselves to the limit, absolutely, especially for concussion prevention, like the omega-9 plasmalogens are really, really critical for me for prevention of concussions and that kind of stuff. But for maintaining neuromuscular junction function, act, uh, sports recovery rates, healing rates, um, like you're healthy, you make enough to survive, but your body isn't designed to perform at super high levels, okay? And so you need nutrient capability. And our, and our food supply is not as rich as it used to be. And even when, it, even when it was, it still didn't have everything that we needed. Things like your creatine, people need to be taking creatine and carnitine. So I go through a kind of a cocktail of things that are core biochemical intermediates that you can get in your diet and it creates an optimal health environment inside. So plasmalogens are critical. So yeah, the answer is like me, first minute, I, I'm in my early fifties and um, I take my plasmalogens in the morning and at night every day. 
Um, been on it for a couple of years. My dad's in his mid, he's just turned 85. He functions like he's in his 60s. I've had him on plasma medicines for about three years now, um, since because that's one of the reasons I've made these things. So all most people in our family, like I've, you know, we've done some tremendous dramatic things. But for optimized health, you'll notice differences in your workout routines, your your muscle development, and your muscle recovery rates in athletes. You definitely will notice differences there. And Vision, the show that already, off, you saying? Sorry? There are studies that show that in terms of recovery or athletic performance, or those not, still kind of not formal studies, just okay. anecdotal studies, um, myself included. Um, and so, but you'll you'll when you're when you're trying to find out is something actually are you feeling something? You will. You'll notice these things. Um, and it's not. It's really not rocket science. It's it's really a critical nutritional component of these functions, and that's why. It feels a little bit weird because it says, okay, what are the one things, right? And for plasmalogens, the canary in the coal mine is cognition. Okay, the one big thing, like if you take the one thing that most people will notice first and foremost, because that's the kind of the shiny object, that's the one that kind of really bugs you and you notice something, I can't remember this and that, it's cognition. And that, and I can get into details, but the reason for that is the cholinergic system. The cholinergic system, which is responsible for our cognitive functioning in the brain is uniquely sensitive to plasmalgen defect deficiencies. So that's what we see first. And that's highly correlated with sarcopenia, which is loss of muscle. Um, and that's your neuromuscular junction is also uh, an acetylcholine um, neuron. So anyway, so those, those are the things, clearly people see the cognitive functioning. But Young people and children with asthma or bronchial dysplasia, your lungs, the, the surfactant function of your lungs or plasmalogen. That's why it's, it's, it's a core human physiological thing. And we get different people. Like it's just, we, people report back to us, hey, my heart arrhythmia is gone. It restored the, the sinus rhythms of their heart. Like, and you don't know this in advance. And so, but it makes, but these are molecules that are involved in these core critical things. And, and and it's really, if you take any major vitamin deficiency, right? If I say, hey, here's someone who has a thiamine deficiency or riboflavin deficiency, the list of symptoms that would come from a from one of those deficiencies is quite large, okay? And that's where your genetic predisposition comes in. So I take a thousand people and I subject them all to a plasmalogen deficiency. You're going to get different subgroups of, of um, symptomology based upon that individual and that individual's um, environmental exposure over the course of their, their life. And that's why doing all the all the biomarker testing is important, as you mentioned, because you're, it's it's a bill it buys ability to do the oxidative stress, it's a buys ability to detox, it's how your mitochondria is functioning. It's not like it's my, my you you have really great analogy, and I can tell you've been doing this these lectures for a while because you have all these ways of explaining it. My way is kind of a, the safety deposit box method for a lot of this stuff where you turn all the keys at the same time, things are gonna work much better, much more effectively. If you try to do things piecemeal and trying to whack them all, sometimes they work great. And sometimes you're, you, it just doesn't work as well because you're not fixing the whole flow of the system there. So, exactly. couple, so I mean, in terms of the, the brain benefits of plasmology, it's gonna benefit somebody who unfortunately has Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. It's also going to help somebody who's just trying to optimize and be proactive with their health. So work, what's great about plasmologens, it's going to work on both sides of the spectrum. It's not something that it has a very has a small niche. It has a really, really huge niche. And I think that niche is going to grow and grow as and more and more studies come out. And the two types do two very different things. Like the omega-9, which we use primarily for designed for autism and multiple sclerosis and autoimmune diseases. But we get a lot of feedback on reduced um, stress, sleep. And I've got some anecdotal work on bipolar disorder that's been pretty amazing on the omega-9. So the omega-9 helps you get a lot of feedback on sleep. It's neurological calming. And I tell people, it's like tuning your radio station. The omega-3, the proteome neuro is for performance and the proteome glia is for protection. And it's like an old radio where you're trying to tune the station. So you have two knobs, you have a tuning knob and you have a volume knob. But if you have the, if the station is not quite tuned in, it's staticky. As long as you keep the volume low, you can kind of hear the music behind the static, right? But as soon as you, you tune the station and you get it right nicely tuned, then you can crank the volume up. So glia helps 
reduce that noise. The glia is like neurological tuning. It makes the neurons work better. Whereas neuro turns the volume up. Neuro is, is gonna increase the performance, increase your, your brain function, your, your memory, your neuromuscular function. And glia helps rebuild um, and, and tuning. So those are the, they have very different functions, but they, they're very effective in what they do. And so yeah, that's kind of where, um, you know, different people have different purposes for them. No, I mean, it sounds like it has, again, the neurogenesis that you talked about before, the terms of the neurons building and how it works on the, on the, on the muscle junctions with acetylcholine, which I'm assuming is part of the reason how you get some of the psychiatric effects of bipolar and mood issues, as opposed to the healing of the inflammation of the brain with the, the glia cells and things like that, which has always been associated with how some supplements help with mood issues, but the drug companies have always seemed to kind of push that to the side and just take your Prozac deficiency, just take your uh, your Prozac or your Trileptal and you'll be fine, which is a right. whole nother rabbit hole for another day, but uh, right. you're preaching to the choir there. Um, so let's, so for patients now, if I wanted to, I want to take plasmologins, like you said, you can get it from food. It's usually may not be enough and everybody doesn't absorb it or use it. And sometimes you just can't um, uh, absorb things faster than you're getting rid of it. So mm -hmm. most patients, so this is an oral, this is usually an oral medication yeah. um, or supplement, we'll call it a supplement to be fair. Um, and it's taken a lot of times, multiple times a day. Um, so just describe to people how they should be taking it. And then we're gonna kind of go into that. This is not just a nerve thing that has other benefits as you were kind of starting to talk about, but people are going to, so how do I start taking this stuff? You tell me all the cool benefits, my workout's gonna be better. My brain's gonna be better. It may help my mood. How do I do this? How do I start? Well, I recommend you take, stuff? I take the neuro first thing in the morning and it gets me through my day. Like I, I do intermittent fasting. So there's, there's, you know, you also want to help yourself, you know, in other positive ways, right? So one of the things that humans need to do is they need to be on caloric restricted fasting more because your body works best under a fasting state. So I like to take my neuro, which is activating in the morning and I'll take a couple of mils of it, um, like a teaspoon of it in the morning. And that gets me through my day. And I have my other supplements that, you know, like I use for antioxidants and things like N-acetylcysteine and carnitine and creatine. Take those in the morning on an empty stomach personally. And then at night, about two hours before bed, I'll take glia, a couple of bills of glia. And that helps the rebuilding at nighttime when I'm rebuilding membranes. And so that's my basic routine. And so you want to, the, the neuro, depending upon the person, it can jack you up. Like you feel like you're like, it's like neuro does this to your brain. Like it, 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 you feel an opening, the lights get brighter. Like it, it's, 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 it really feels like an opening feeling. Whereas glia does this, it gives you focus. Like people that have ADHD or they have autism, they have a hard time. Like you're reading a paragraph, right? And you're reading partly. And then after three words, your brain is on something else. When they start taking glia, they say, well, I can read the whole paragraph. Like it, it gets their brain focused. It gets rid of the noise in their brains. And it's really quite dramatic. And you'll notice it within hours, like even in, in 20 minutes, an ADHD or an, aut an adult autistic person on the spectrum will notice that kind of function. So for those type of people, you take the glia whenever you want to during the day. Right. That was my question. Okay. But, but neuro, you got to be careful for neuro for bipolar or autism or ADHD or any kind of, because it's activating. So you don't want to activate a system that's already in stress, for example. Right. So say you have neuropathic pain, for example, you may not want to take the neuro right away. You want to focus first on the glia. You want to calm those systems down first. And then after a month or two or less, you can bring in the function. So I always tell people work on protection first, work on performance second. And then, um, but if you're generally healthy, as a general rule, general healthy person, you're just working, you want to make sure your boardroom and your, your thinking straight. Um, the neuro is fundamentally the, the, the primary product. Neuro is fairly ubiquitous. That's your, you'll notice performance enhancement um, fairly quickly, actually. Um, and, that's kind of where you go. And neuro is for the athlete as well then? Or yeah. glia is more? Okay. Neuro is for performance of the athlete. Glia is for protection of the athlete. And okay. we can have a whole conf conversation on traumatic brain injury or concussion. And that's a whole different space. But essentially glia is for prevention of concussion and the restoration of concussion, very specifically, because when you have a concussion or you have a, a localized brain insult, it's mind, it, the white matter inflammation and, and restoring the, the myelin sheath, 
that's where the you want that omega nine getting right into your brain on that function. So yeah, for mostly if you're just improving performance, um, if you're already pretty healthy and you just want to be better, the neuro is what you want to start with. Yeah, as we're we're taping this, I don't know if you're a sports fan. There's been a huge controversy about concussions in, in football. Is one of the there's been a uh, question how the NFL is handling concussions and. I unfortunately get a lot of TBI and concussion patients and we give fish oil, but this may be. Uh, no, you don't want to do fish oil. Um, okay. yeah, so personally, personally, it's more of a, like a oleo palmitide or you need that omega-9. See, the problem with concussions is that they don't go away. The, 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 so when you take the omega-3s and you, and you improve function, what you're doing is you're training the athlete to work around the concussion. Okay, so when you get this return to play designation, the concussion is still there. Okay, what they've done is they've just adapted to the concussion. The concussion, the, the, the physio, and, and, the, and the real way to measure the concussion activity is more advanced diffusion tensor imaging of the brain. And when you actually get into the myelin water fraction, so there's technologies called NODI, like Neurite Orientation and Dispersion Index MRI. Because what happens is you get this brain swelling and you get this inflammatory, and it's almost like um, like the myelin is a, is a wrapping. It's like an it's like, an, it's like take a take a roll of electrician's tape and you just wrap it around, 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 around. And when you get a concussion, that tape kind of loosens up. It's kind of loosely wrapped now. Okay, it's in it, all the all the spaces in between the wrapping gets gets inflamed, and that's called and that shows up in myelin water fraction. And so you really need to get in there. And problem with the brain, like when you get an insult on your muscle, you get, you get hit in the shoulder, for instance, you get a big bruise. You have all this circulatory system. You have all this ability to clear that and send material to build it and, and fix it. Your brain is a closed system, okay? It has to fix itself from inside itself. And so when you get a concussion, what happens is you, you, you get this isolated area and the concussion can last for their whole life. It can never go away. The inflammatory component, like an autistic child that has an inflamed brain at age 12 has the same inflamed brain when they're 45 years old. Okay, when you take postmortem analysis of, of like, so brain inflammation is an incredibly difficult thing to resolve just by natural, it just, it just doesn't naturally go away. If you want brain inflammation to go away, you actually have to feed it critical components um, to do that. So that's where the whole, like it's a big long conversation, but we can measure this more. There's been good studies on this return to play um, aspects of the, the, the athlete outwardly shows that they can do a return to play, but the actual physiology of her, that person is, is virtually unchanged. And they've just adapted to the concussion rather than the concussion resolving itself. Yeah, I'm, I'm, this whole concussion space has, it, there's some work to be done there. And, and we get more minor concussions than we, we think, you know, people hit their heads on this and that. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot more transient concussions. And this is where the white matter loss comes in. Like you think about like living for a hundred years, living si after you're 60 years old, you've had 60 years to be concussed off and on here and there. Most of us would never even remember how many times we've hit our head in our lifetime. Can you imagine how many times you've hit your head and don't even know about it? All right. Like it's like, so you have this collective um, issue and we have a lot of this subchronic. And I think this is why we get these, these feedback loops from people that all of a sudden they, their, their brain inflammation starts coming down. And all we're doing is we're just feeding the brain building material. We're just, we're just feeding it material to build that myelin sheath. It's really that simple. It's basically concentrated breast milk is what glia is <laughs> as as funny as it sounds that's pretty much what it is um you know it's just purified and it's made by scratch and it's you know it's highly 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 concentrated so. i definitely gotta add I have two pieces i definitely think about right now that i want to add it to them based on what you're saying here so that's that's really great information so we we talked so we talked about that was again brain nerves, but I mean the, the other main area, and you kind of hinted at throughout your the discussion here, is that you have plasmalogens throughout the body, other big locations of the heart, the lung, the kidney area. You mentioned uh, ch unfortunately premature ch uh, children have the issues with their lung, and that may be part of it. Same, you mentioned again, you you must be psychic because you get hit 
heart, you talked about arrhythmias healing by uh, starting on some type of plasmology and you talked about kidney uh, dysfunction. So again, so, so talk about more of the broad scope again. I think as, as well, more there's, 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 out the so broad I, stroke of plasmologens there. So I talked about neurology a lot. The other two main areas are cholesterol transport. So atherosclerosis. So when you have the foamy macrophage perspective and you're trying to lower, you're trying to get that foamy macrophage shrink. Part of that is your reverse cholesterol transport. And this is part of that APOE4 conversation that we started off with. But your ability to, your, your cell's ability to share cholesterol is through the HDL system. And in order to accept, you have to, your cell, you have your LDL system that brings cholesterol into your cells and your HDL system that sends cholesterol out of your cells and, um, or HDL transports it. That export is through an enzyme called ACAC, acyl cholesterol transferase. And that enzyme is under plasmalogen control. We can turn it on and off based upon the levels of specifically omega-3 plasmalogens, DHA plasmalogens, the proton neural. So proton neural dramatically improves reverse cholesterol transport. And this is why we see C-reactive proteins dropping, malondialdehyde levels come down. And so membrane cholesterol transport um, plasmalogens are critically involved. And that is actually the reason why pl DHA plasmalogen specifically, proton neural specifically, is the antidote for the ApoE4 genotype. So the E4 genotype has a reverse cholesterol transport weakness. And that's not a problem for 60 years of their life. So the E4 genotype does not become a risk factor for Alzheimer's till later in life. And all it does is it shifts the curve, okay, to a younger group. The distribution still remains the same. It's just that it all happens a bit earlier. And it's because ApoE4 carriers have a re reduced ability to perform reverse cholesterol transport. So plasmalogens are critically involved in that. So that's one aspect. And the other one is straight, straight out um, oxidative stress. Your body makes these plasmalogens like little fuses. Like they're actually made to be sacrificed. They're the first line of defense. So it prevents oxidative stress dramatically. It reduces, it's, it's the largest free radical scavenger in the human body. The only problem is when, it's, when it scavenges those free radicals, it neutralizes them, but it blows up in the process. So every time a plasmalogen neutralizes a free radical, your body has to make another one. And that's no problem when you're young and you're middle age, but it becomes a problem when you're older because now if you have increased oxidative stress and you're consuming, you know, your plasmalogens are being chewed up because of that oxidative stress and you have an impaired ability to restore those plasmalogens, then that oxidative stress really starts knocking you down. And so, plas so plasmalogens themselves are, are critical first line of defense um, against oxidative stress. So those are the other two areas that we haven't talked in great detail. We just published work with an escalating dose showing that as, as plasmalogens go up in your blood, your malondialdehyde levels go down, catalase function goes up. So this is all very well documented in, in, in different work. So those are the other two areas that um, more of a core chemistry component um, you know, you're, you're not going to feel that, right? Like you, you're not going to feel your oxidative stress markers come down. You're going to see it in your blood work, but you're not necessarily going to feel it. The neurological components is what you actually, tip people will notice in their, in their everyday lives. So you actually, when I go, went into this talk thinking that I would be the cool the highlights for me in terms of where I, how I would use it and people out there listening would listen, would use it has now kind of flipped on me. Again, I didn't know as much about the athletic performance. I thought it would be a nice add-on, but I didn't think it had as much power as it does. And, and what people know about oxidative stress is oxidative stress, your body always has some innate part of oxidative stress as part of your body recycling and garbage removal process. You need a protection, but when that process gets off kilter is when you lead to issues, everything from fatigue to associated now with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, they think it's associated with diabetes and the list goes on and on and on. And also the relevance to mitochondrial dysfunction, which is linked to all the things we talked about today. So- right. And all these things create a load. They, they create a load. They, they create a metabolic load on your body, okay? Like when you have oxidative stress, that's the energy being used to combat oxidative stress that could be used for other things, okay? Like you are a closed system. You have a limited amount of physiological energy to be applied to different things. And so when you have all these other stressors happening, all these loads suck your vitality down. And so you wanna, you wanna, you, you wanna re remove those, those loads from your health. 
exactly. I'm thinking like some superhero movies that's something stuck in my mentality. But anyway, I'm just <laughs> really yeah. vivid images. We've gone from like cake yeah. and candy. Now we have some <laughs> stuck in my vitality out. Yeah. And you want to take your plasmalogen. So where are we headed? Where I mean, you are your group. Your company and some other companies out there, but especially you guys are really kind of, like you said, in the forefront of the research now with what's going on with plasmologens. Where are we heading to this? Is this something that's going to become, I think it already is getting there in terms of a, a pretty common mainstream supplement? Are we talking about doing IV plasmologens at some point, surgically injecting it into a joint? Where is the, 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 the future that we're going to see in the next two years, the next 10 years? Well, it's getting more and more ubiquitous. And, and probably it'll eventually become like a vitamin. Really, it, it, it is that core and it just kind of lost, it, it got lost out in left field somehow. It's not like we haven't known about these things for years and years. We just haven't, humans haven't really thought about late life vitality. Okay, it's only been the last 20, 30 years that we really seriously been thinking about this stuff. Like we live in a world where, you know, if you live to 75, 80, you should be happy for a healthy life. You know, shut up and die already, right? Like we kind of have this, we have this elder abuse mindset of saying, You've lived your life, now go away for the rest of us. It's, and so we we don't really, we, it's only been the last few decades that elderly people, we you know, quote elderly people, want to live strong and healthy. So plasmalogens are going to be critical for that transition process. Absolutely. But where it's really going to go, the IV for sure. Um, in, but that's, that's to do paint by number. Okay. What I see really exciting, obviously maintaining health and, and keeping it there. The oral is totally fine. Like there's, there's, it's amazing. It gets, it, it's the plasmalgin precursors that we manufacture called alkyl acyglycerols. They are designed to be oral. They are specifically designed to go because they, they, they go through the triglycerol process. And it's a whole different conversation of how your VLDL through your liver, through your lymph. Like when you eat a meal, the first thing that gets sent to your brain and all your body cells is fat, triglycerides. That's the most important nutrient of the human body. And it gets, when you, the first thing that enters that your body sends out to all of its cells after a meal is fat, triglycerides through the VLDL system. And then it sends the other nutrients, phospholipids on the second round. These plasmalogens are specifically designed as alkyl acyglycerols. They get shipped to the brain. And this is why people we feel them fast. Like if you take a good dose of the, you can feel it literally in minutes. And so it's designed, so the oral administration is absolutely designed to get a nice peak level. So pharmacokinetically, there's no additional benefit. Now, from an IV perspective, this is where you start saying, okay, I want to rebuild the human brain, paint by number approach. I can do an advanced MRI scan. I can identify areas and then I can focus that area using say focus ultrasound. I can increase the circulation of specific brain areas. And if I do that in combination with IV therapy, I can start now rebuilding brain regions in a, in a paint by number approach. And we can start rebuilding the human brain. And that's kind of where the, the next step of, I think um, we, we don't use advanced MRI nearly enough. And you know, as our brain goes, the rest of our body goes, we just typically don't get a chance to look at it very closely. It's stuck behind our skull. Okay, we don't really, like the MRI technology is focused on you know, hey, do I have a hole in my head? Like it's it's really the diagnostic, you know, MRI is used as a, as a, as a morphological diagnostic tool, but not, it has so much functional value to it. And we want to increase functional outcomes. We need to measure function and maintain function. So I, I see MRI being more and more of a interactive tool. It should be done in conjunction with your regular yearly blood tests, for example. Like you, I think we really, I think you're going to start seeing that in conjunction with other things. Like my, when people, when we get our blood tests through here every, you know, quite a volume, it's a homework assignment. And, and part of it is to tell people, look, you have power. You have control over these biomarkers. These biomarkers are not controlling you, okay? You, you have control over those. Your you can change your uric acid levels. You can change your creatinine levels. You can change your cholesterol. You can move all these things. Get your triglycerides below 100. Put them in the 60 to 90 range. And, and so we can look at mitochondrial function. And so part of that is putting this demystifying. People are so scared of their health. They think they don't know. They don't. It's like 
it's like a random lightning striking function in their world. And they don't really feel that they have that sense of control and power. And so what do we do is teach people like this is a homework assignment. I expect you to get this marker to here, this to here, this to here, this here. And here's how you're going to do it. And we're going to do this, come back in a few months, see how close we got. And then after that, and then once you found your health zone, okay, you want to stay there. And then you can add more advanced stuff. There's lots of cool stuff out there. Like you talk about peptides and other functional improvements, like exosomes and, you know, and even then, if we're trying to improve exosome structure and function, okay, a lot of that exosome release is plasmalogen related, right? Because in order for a cell to, to, to vesicularize and, and send out an exosome, you know, those exosomes are made with plasmalogens. And so, so anyway, so I think there's lots of advancement. Um, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a triaging approach, right? Like I tell people, I do the simplest stuff. Like there's lots of people doing really some good, fancy, amazing, amazing stuff out there. And my job is to get the core operating system of the human body working. Like there's a, and I kind of take over the forgotten biochemistry, the old stuff. Like the, I, in my presentations, I, pre I reference papers from the forties and fifties. Like this is not brand new stuff. We just don't, we don't have a lack of knowledge. We have a, we have an inability to apply it and implement it. And so I'm kind of the guy who brings up some of this, all this old stuff and say, okay, you know what? We've got to get some of this basic operating system working. And then, then from the basic operating system, we can start getting better and better function above that. You don't fix the foundation, no matter what you're trying to work on a tree, the, the, the house falls down. Correct. So two quick questions I know I'm, I, I always get. So I have Crohn's disease. I have what I have Crohn's disease, I have celiac. Am I still going to be able to absorb and get the benefit from an oral plasmologen? Oh yeah, it was, it's still absorbable. And you know, when we talk about Crohn's, like some of that gut-related aspects, we can talk more. There's, there's, there is better treatments. The plasmalogens are, especially the omega nine, in terms of getting that that uh, epithelial junctions sealed up in your gut. Okay, and in, in you, you've been working with peptides like BBC one fifty seven, and and so some of the gut health-related stuff, we actually have some pretty good tools now to improve that function. And then, but yeah, so you're not going to have any problems with absorption. It's one of the core physiological absorbable. If you can't, if you can't absorb plasmalogens, you're dead because you can't absorb anything. Sure. And then is there anybody who should not be taking the plasmalogens as a supplement right now? Is there some contraindication where, I mean, I can't think of one, but you, this is your- No, there's the only thing that um, like I'm, I'm careful about is like, so for the, the omega-3s, like DHA plasmalogens, like I think- autism and multiple um, bipolar diseases of, of, um, of excessive neurological function to begin with. Okay. When they're, when they have over diseases of over activity of the brain. Okay. You want to be careful with the omega three because it's going to potentially make it even more. Okay. So omega nines for those individuals. And the only other place I'm careful with, and because there's lots of contradiction, not contradiction, but there's not enough data on it is in cancer. So if, you, if you're an active metastatic cancer. So alkylglycerols are actually very powerful for reducing damage from radiation therapy. And they're actually show that they shrink tumor growth. Okay, so a common component of all cancers is a pre-existing plasmalogen deficiency. So that's it. So almost all cancers, and we've done, I don't know, 20 different cancers, they all have low plasmalogens and it precedes the cancer. So we just published a big paper on breast cancer on this. And, um, and after treatment for breast cancer and basically cure, their plasmalogen still remain low. However, in the actual actively growing cancer cell itself, since it's an actively growing cell, it will have high levels of plasmalogens. And so we typically do a, and we have advanced doctors working with their patients on this, is that they use the plasmalogens before and after active chemo, but not during the actual chemotoxic process. Okay, so you use the plasmalogens to recover and because part of cancer is shrinking the cancer. And you, we're, actually pretty, we're actually pretty good at targeting cancer and killing cancer. Okay, the, 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 the medical science is actually really good at that for the most part. What we're not good at is recovering from our treatments. Okay, and how do you, how do you recover? How do you how do you get the surrounding cells to restore their health? 
because if you kill the cancer, you still got to refill that hole. Okay, you have to, it's it's you have to shrink the cancer. The only way a cancer shrinks is because good healthy cells are being formed and pushing the cancer out. Okay, like your body can't live with a hole in it, so you got to fill it up. And so what people are doing with cancer is that they're using plasmalogens before and after chemotoxic um, cycling. And so that's something I think people should keep an eye on. Um, the, the actual published evidence is that the plasmalogens are associated with, with uh, tumor shrinkage, okay? But there's not huge amounts of data on that. So I think it's a doctor by doctor taking it um, carefully. From a prevent for prevention of cancer, absolutely you should be on the, the DHA plasmalogens un unambiguously because um, you want to have that cholesterol transport mechanism working properly. But if you're an active metastatic cancer, I think you should be carefully monitored. That's the perfect answer. So that's that's so that's plasmalogens. Uh, there's an, an, it's a very growing um, interest in it. A lot of great benefits, as Dr. Goodnow presented to us. So where can people find you and hear about look at Prodrome and can they order directly from the site? Do they have to go through a doctor? Uh, how can they find information about you and your company and go from there? Yeah. So there's multiple ways. Prodrome.com. You can buy supplements directly from them. Um, uh, the um, they're actually on Amazon now. But the doctors, we have a lot of certified doctors that will give you much more. So I always recommend people work with certified doctors. Um, like there are so many amazing functional med doctors out there and there's just no substitute for someone with some experience on multiple levels. So I, I try to get people, get your hands on a good functional med doctor. It'll help you get through how many supplements to take and how many not to take and so on and so forth. But protom.com, um, the Amazon's on Amazon now, but also through our doctor network. And you're gonna get much better pricing through a doctor network, okay? Um, we, you know, we take care of our doctors very carefully and they're well-trained. And I think that's, I still believe your best hope for healthy longevity, um, even with or without a disease is, you know, getting a good doctor on your hands um, and they're getting better and better all the time. And that's what my, my primary focus. And so there's, an, if you look at my research, research is at drgoodnow.com. So the Dr. Goodnow Research Institute and you'll see the kind of clinical trials that we're going on and how doctors get trained. And then we can re refer people to doctors in their field. And we're going to get more and more active in that regard. But, you know, you can do it yourself. Absolutely. Blood testing, supplements. And, um, and then, you know, I think it's, it's making sure we're not here to put you in a box. Basically, we're here to help you live when whatever box you choose to put yourself in so we're trying to make sure we have options available for each person based upon their current life situation and if they want to do it by themselves let's give them tools there's lots of educate there's a lot of education on my website that deals with the biomarkers um, lots of detailed science so you can learn it yourself and then um but it also we think that um doctor education and training is, is going to be the the core because people still want to be taken care of. You know, yeah, like, the, you, you know. want to get that flow going with a, a, a doctor who has that background in terms of how to implement it with other things going on. Yeah, cosmologens are great, but you, you still want to fix the underlying conditions and treat the abnormal lever, like you said. We're going to put all the information that Dr. Goodnow gave us in the show notes, how you can contact him. They also, I mean, I know you guys are, it seems like you guys are now um, really upright, not uprightly, I'm talking science now, uh, really starting to do more on social media. I know you have some stuff on Instagram now as well. Um, I think also for the Institute, it was either Twitter or Instagram. One of your social media channels are now starting to build up a little bit. So check them out. There's always really great information. Dr. Grinnell, thanks for coming on, giving us really great insight in terms of how important plasma organs are and how they can be used. And uh, stay tuned for another episode soon of the Life Optimized podcast. It was a pleasure, Neil. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.